How to access the Emergency Response Data Platform. Any public safety agency can access life-saving emergency data through the Rapid SOS Emergency Response Data Platform. There are two ways of doing so. Rapid SOS Portal is a powerful web-based tool that enables you to manage emergencies and access location and supplemental data for every call in your jurisdiction. Signing up for Rapid SOS Portal is easy and only takes a few minutes. In addition to emergency management tools and data, Rapid SOS Portal includes a training platform as well as administrative tools to manage user permissions, track usage, and analyze trends in your agency. To learn more and sign up for Rapid SOS Portal, please visit rapidsosportal.com. Rapid SOS also integrates with every major CAD, CPE, mapping, or other public safety softwares. With an integration, you can receive Rapid SOS data through your existing workflow, and you won't need any additional screens, tabs, or windows. To learn more about integrations, visit rapidsos.com slash public dash safety dash partners. Welcome to the 2024 Winter and Spring EM, EMP Study Group Week 8. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about emergency management and disruption of service. Um, okay, I just, I had something I wanted to show you after, so I wanted to make sure that it would open. And just to take care of a few housekeeping things, uh, if you have stumbled upon this video on YouTube, and it is before June 21st, and you would like to be added to this current live study group where you can access all of the videos, the PDFs, any additional information that I provide, practice exams, et cetera, you can go ahead and scan that QR code to the left or visit onscenefirst.com forward slash training forward slash study ENP. And we will be happy to add you to the Google group as well as the um, the calendar invite for the live sessions that are on Fridays at 3 p.m. Eastern. I know today's Tuesday and it's going to screw me up, but um, I didn't, I don't have class scheduled this Friday, so I didn't want to uh, miss two weeks in a row. I had something I had to deal with on Friday that I couldn't get on. Uh, if you're watching this after June 21st, 2024, and you would like access to the archived materials, which you will get everything that was provided during the uh, live study group, it's just in an archived form. Uh, you can go ahead and go to that same website, onscenefirst.com forward slash training forward slash study ENP. And then uh, we are going to be taking a brief hiatus, uh, pausing the live sessions. I need to get some of my own stuff done and I've been trying to do too much and it's not serving me well. So I have to put a pause on the live study groups, uh, but the archive stuff will 100% be available. And then at some point I will do another live study group. So if you're stumbling upon this and, and need that, that live study group, it, it it will recharge again. I just, I have some things that I, I need to work on. So there's that. But if you want to get information and notified when that next live study group goes or keep up with my shenanigans, head on over to onscenefirst.com and click subscribe right there at the top. And you can add your name and email to be notified of all of the cool stuff that is going on at On Scene First. Uh, thank you to my premier study group sponsor, Rapid SOS. Without their generosity, I would not be able to do this study group for you guys as long as I have been able to do it. And with their sponsorship, as well as uh, the sponsorship from Responder Services Consulting and LB Communications, I'm able to give away five scholarships, which if you submitted for a scholarship, you should have been notified on May 10th. However, that did not happen. And to spare you the frustrating details, um, in true Tracy fashion, there was a conundrum that prevented me from getting everything in a row to make it possible for me to award that on Friday the 10th. And then I had to reschedule this session and I didn't have all the responses back 
uh, yet from the emails from the agency and the folks that submitted to say they are ready to take the exam um, and that they are still interested. So if you are one of the folks that submitted and you haven't seen an email from me yet uh, that you would have gotten yesterday, I think it was, uh, to just get communication back that you are still wanting to take the exam, uh, please shoot me an email at tldridge at onscenefirst.com so we can make sure that you are still considered. And it is my goal to get those notifications out by this Friday. Um, and you'll still have uh, a week to get your application submitted before the deadline. So I apologize. And again, that's, you know, just one of the par for the course where where I'm struggling to make all the ends meet. And this will will be um, this will be it for this particular uh, spawn, uh, scholarship for um, for now. But we'll we'll get back to that. So thank you for your patience and understanding. So let's jump into emergency management. What I do know is there are a handful of questions on emergency management. So, you know, there are some places where I will tell you to spend more time in quizzing yourself, reading the materials, really having an understanding of the stages of particular things and emergency management is one of them. So make sure that you do your due diligence here because I do recall a handful of questions uh, being on this particular topic. And what I mean by that is, you know, knowing the difference of the things that happen in the recovery phase or the mitigation or the response or the preparedness. And while many of the things overlap each other. Um, I I want you to really, and, and I, I said this before, and it's funny because when I get the thank yous from folks that they passed the exam and they just wanted to thank me for the study group, one of the things that they thank me for is the constant reminder to read the question, to get rid of the wrong answer, because there's one really wrong answer. Like, I, this is just kind of the way that I see it playing out. There's one that's just like, mm, no way. There's one that you're like, yeah, I don't think that one's it. You can get rid of that one too. And then there's going to be two other answers that they both could be right. And what I say they both could be right, I mean, like, it could be right if you had a, another series of circumstances. In other words, if you have to say, when you're taking an exam like the EMP exam, if you have to say, if this, then that would be right. Like if this was to happen or if this was to be in place, that's probably not the right answer. Because when you take an exam like this and you have those two answers that could be right, you need to read the question. You need to only be, and, and it's so funny. It's literally funny that, that I'm saying this right now because in the trial that I've been listening to, the judge had just explained something similar to the jury. You can only base your decision on the evidence that was provided to you. And it's the same thing for these types of questions. And I've been, and I've been studying, helping my daughter study with her uh, EMT exam. And she's like, yeah, but mom, if this blah, 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 right. But that's not in this scenario. They didn't list it in the scenario. So you have to assume it doesn't exist. And I'll, I'll give you an example. If, if the question had to do with, um, what is, um, what is going to be the priority in this particular scenario? If scene safety is not listed, then it doesn't get included. Or, you know, in our fire department, if I'm an EMT and I respond to a call, there's other EMTs and first responders that respond. So I have manpower. I have people that can help me do things. 
But in a traditional ambulance service, they don't have extra people. It's two people. So in one of the questions, she said, yeah, but in our department, we would have extra people to do. And then I have to reel her back in and say, right. But it doesn't say that in, in the description of the scenario that you have. And so you have to make an assumption that at face value, you only have what is listed there. So it says you, the, the question, you and your partner, right? So what does that mean? It's just you and your partner. It, it isn't you and your partner and the firefighters. And I know this isn't, I, I'm just trying to compare. Does that make sense? Read the question and make sure that you're basing the right answer on the information that's being provided there for you. And so I, I want to kind of, I wanted to really explain that, on, especially on the emergency management, because you're going to see as we present some of these components that they, um, that some of them may overlap. So if they're overlapping, you're really going to need to read the question to determine which phase it wants the answer for. So I hope that is helpful. Thank you, Leslie. I appreciate that. Um, I just think it's really important because I'm not a test taker. I, I mentioned this before. I have ADHD. I don't read all the words. I I will, another mistake that many of us make is we'll read the question and then we'll skim over the answers and we'll see that right answer. The one that could be right. However, there was one that was more right based on the situation. And so take that time. You have the time, take the time and read the question, every single word, and then read every answer. I know you've been told that before, but folks get caught. They, they get caught not reading the full question. And if you have to read the question twice, read it twice and start eliminating um, and then get down to those last two answers. So when we look at emergency management, usually there is a hazard that is attached to it. Um, and in this case, as far as a hazard analysis goes, there are different types of events. So there's natural disaster events, there's environmental events, and then there could be human uh, caused events. There are different types of disasters that are broken down into a few different categories. So when we talk about localized disasters, um, it could be severe weather that is isolated to a particular area, meaning severe weather, a flood, or a tornado. So if the question is asking you, you know, it could this... But again, this could be also a regional or maybe a national, depending on what it is, um, but localized and regional can overlap each other. So you have a hurricane that has gone through, um, you know, several states or an earthquake or, or even a wildfire, right? So localized is going to be specific kind of to you know this this one little area for the most part so read the question and then um there are psap only disasters so if there's something uh specifically that happens to the psap um hold on one second Um, that's going to happen specifically to the PSAP. So we talked about the DDoS attacks, uh, ransomware, arson, vandalism, things like that. And then there are disasters that can happen to the network or the transport facilities. And remember, I'm using that term, like the term facilities, um, facilities can be used in two ways here. It's going to be the facilities, uh, trans the transport facilities are the wires, the conduit, how the information gets from one place to the other. And then the facilities also meaning the central office, et cetera. 
And this can include, you know, the telephone cables being cut or damaged either or, or loss or isolation of the central office, the end office, um, or any of the, the pieces in that network. And we're going to go through the disruption of services that's going to explain what loss of isolation and uh, loss and isolation of these things is specifically. So we're going to go over these individual, but I'm just kind of putting these up here with just a brief, quick definition. These are the phases that are going to overlap each other in some places. So mitigation is our first one. Mitigation is all the activities that are des uh, designed to limit the impact of future disasters. So when we get to the last one, when we're in kind of that recovery phase, recovery and mitigation can overlap each other in different places because recovery is actually fixing some of the stuff that went wrong. However, it can also be mitigation because we are trying to look ahead and make sure that whatever happened does not happen again. Preparedness is the actual activity of, of doing the thing to specifically um, prepare for the emergency. So bringing in sandbags, um, opening up the shelters, getting bottles of water on standby, bringing in generators. It's the act of actual um, the act of preparing for not planning if something should happen. If we're planning if something should happen, then it's going to be in the mitigation. But if we are actually preparing for an emergency, we know a big hurricane's coming. Um, the, there's the potential for you know a wildfire to hit our area. If we're preparing for the incident that is taking place, then that is going to fall under preparedness. The response is just that activities that respond to the actual emergency, such as fire suppression and rescue or service restoration. Now, service restoration is also going to fall under recovery to an extent. So response, when we have service restoration, this is not, it, 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 it is this, but not limited to these things. So if we have a significant power outage that has affected our, you know, our, our town government, our EOC, things like that, well, part of the response is to get the electric company out there and say, we need to get this temporarily up and running, right? So it's part of the response. But then when we move over and step over into the recovery, these are activities designed to restore service to its original level or better. And again, recovery and mitigation may overlap. Um, response and recovery may overlap, but they specifically mention recovery and mitigation. So just be careful when you're um, reading through some of these. So mitigation as a general breakdown. So as we said, it involves activities and measures to reduce or eliminate long-term risk of human life or property, um, risk of human life or property from natural or man-made disasters. So some of the key, ID, key, key activities here, identifying, assessing potential risks and vulnerabilities. So here in our jurisdiction, uh, in my jurisdiction, we only have two convenience stores, right? And so what it would make sense for us to do is make sure that one of those convenience stores is is on, you know, make sure they have generator backup or something. So we're looking ahead to say, hey, these are some things that we can we can do that if we should have an emergency someday, it's going to be beneficial. Implementing policies and measures to reduce the impact of disasters. Having policies and procedures in place prior to right? You don't want to be saying, okay, well, this is um, how are we going to call everybody back if we need, you know, more hands on deck. Developing and enforcing building codes and land use planning. 
investing in infrastructure improvements, and conducting public awareness campaigns to promote risk uh, and reduction practices. You know, one of the things, so mitigation, my husband's the head of the highway department, and on a regular basis, he works, and he's also, that uh, part of it is like the tree maintenance stuff, like the tree warden, if there should be any type of tree incident. Um, and so a couple of times a year, he gets together with the power company and they go around town and they identify dead trees. So that's mitigation, right? So they're they're putting an orange X on trees that are very close to the power lines that could potentially fall over if a major storm should happen. So that's that's considered mitigation. There's no impending storm. They're just doing it as like, you know, proactively versus reactively. Some of the things that fall under mitigation, we're going to break them down uh, specifically. These are not necessarily on your uh, exam. However, I'm providing these to you so you have an understanding of, um, I mean, some of them are listed in the manual or, yeah, in the, in the manual as, as some of the things that could be listed. And it is also listed in one of the links that is listed in the manual as far as FEMA and and um, their emergency management assessments go. And if Nina listed it, then there's a chance that it could be there. But it's important to know kind of what the activities are under each section. So mitigation, implementation of building codes. So the government may in, in your area may enforce and update building codes to in, ensure that the structure structures are designed and constructed to withstand potential hazards such as earthquakes, floods, or hurricanes. So I'm thinking that like Alabama down on Orange Beach, right? I'm sure they have very, in Florida, I'm sure they have very different building codes than I have in rural Massachusetts living on a pond, right? Um, those that are subjected to earthquakes. Even though we had an earthquake not that long ago, it isn't something that we see a lot in this area. But mitigation, making sure that these codes are in place beforehand. Land use planning. So communities engage in effective land use planning to control and regulate land use to minimize disaster vulnerability. It may involve uh, avoiding construction in high-risk areas or establishing buffer zones. Infrastructure improvements. Um, investments are made in critical infrastructure to enhance resilience against disasters. For example, constructing flood barriers, reinforcing bridges, and upgrading drainage systems. And then public education and awareness. Okay, uh, Public campaigns to educate individuals and communities about the potential risks and the importance of being prepared. Uh, may also involve distributing information materials, conducting workshops, and promoting community engagement. One of the things that we talk about all when I was in my 911 center, whenever a big incident was coming, if there was a hurricane coming or a blizzard coming and they were going to have to open the shelter, et cetera, that was the time that everybody starts having the conversation of, well, who are we going to get to volunteer to be in the shelter? That piece of it shouldn't be in the preparedness for the major storm that's coming. That piece should be in the mitigation that we should be working in advance. We work on getting volunteers, educating the public that our community has two shelters. Uh, we need people to open them. These are the things that we're looking for. Taking care of that stuff in advance should not be happening in mitigation. I mean, uh, in preparedness. Uh, hazard mapping and risk assessment. Identifying and mapping areas prone to specific hazards helps keeps the risk level down. This information guides mitigation strategies and resource allocation. And that goes resource allocation as well as uh, not allocating resources. So if you live, so I'm thinking of planting island in the next uh, neighborhood over. I'm sorry, the next town over in Marion. It's kind of like a like a peninsula type thing, right? And and there's there's only one way onto the end of the peninsula and only one way out. And so I can just envision 
them saying, you know, having a plan in place before the major incident to educate the public, hey, just so you know, if this criteria happens, we are not going to be sending a response down there. If this, this, and this are in place, if we have wins at this, you know, speed, if we have this, we are not going down there. So what does that mean? If we're going to have a potential situation, you're going to evacuate. So having that plan in place and educating folks is important. Uh, ecosystem management, preserving and restoring natural ecosystems can contribute to reducing the impact of certain disasters, such as wildfire uh, fires or flooding. Uh, wetlands, for instance, act as a national natural buffer against storm surges. Until I was a firefighter, I never understood like a live burn where they would intentionally start a forest fire and just burn off all of this vegetation. But that's what this is referring to. So mitigation, they're not going to do that before, you know, to prepare for a forest fire. And maybe they do. Um, again, that might be one of those places. Just look at the perspective, right? Is if we have a huge wildfire that is coming towards a place that is, you know, a hundred miles away, and it's it's kind of moving at a slow pace, well, then maybe the folks 100 miles away are like, you know what, we're going to do a prescribed burn, we're going to burn off all this stuff. And maybe by the time it gets to us, it's not going to reburn the stuff that's already been burned. So again, mitigation, but it could also fall over into preparedness. So think about the question as far as they're giving you those questions and the answers that are available. Uh, mitigation, having early warning systems, developing and implementing early warning systems for natural disasters, such as the tsunami warning, a tornado sirens that can provide communities with timely information uh, to evacuate or take proactive uh, protective measures and be proactive about it, as well as any type of text message, reverse 911, email service. Uh, social media presence, et cetera. How are we going to warn folks? That's part of the mitigation, having those things in place prior. Insurance programs, encouraging, encouraging and promoting insurance programs that provide coverage against specific hazard types can help individuals, businesses recover if there should be a loss. Community resilience programs. Again, building this community that is based on social networking, um, making sure that folks are able to be self-sufficient if necessary, and how we can work together to recover. Uh, research and development, investing in research to better understand natural and man-made hazards and develop initiatives uh, and innovative technologies and solutions that contribute to more effective mitigation strategies. So having tested, uh, you know, having having groups of folks doing different types of research to determine what can we do in advance. And then preparedness. The preparedness piece focuses on planning, training, and organizing resources to respond and manage a disaster when it occurs effectively. So getting the things in place. If we are doing it when the event is here, we are now in response mode. So again, it could it could cross over, right? So some of these key activities, developing emergency plans and procedures. If we hadn't done it in mitigation, we're going to do it now. Or maybe we didn't take care of something in mitigation. Maybe there's something different about this situation than the last 10 situations like this. And we have to uh, we have to, you know, switch things up a little bit. Maybe the uh, in the mitigation phase, the junior high school was always the um, shelter. I just the word just totally escaped me. Uh, maybe the junior high was always a shelter, but it's under construction. And it can't be there. So under preparedness, we have to make, you know, a shift. So conducting training and drills for emergency response teams and the general public. Again, you know, just making sure that we're getting prepared. 
establishing communication and coordination, uh, coordination systems, stockpiling emergency supplies and resources, and creating public awareness campaigns to educate people on what to do before, during, and after the disaster. So emergency planning, development and implementation of the emergency plan that outlines specific actions during the disaster, which includes evacuation plans, communication strategies, and coordination mechanisms doing our trainings and drills. Now, this is preparing for the event. This could also fall under mitigation. And I don't think I need to tell you what training and, and drills are. Uh, resource stockpiling, accumulating and maintaining necessary resources such as food, water, medical, and equipment in strategic locations for rapid deployment during emergencies. You know, and it's interesting because we don't always do that, right? Like we know that we're going to need these things. We go get them locally, but not a lot of folks will plan to work with somebody that is not locally that can, you know, get a truck ready, maybe in Texas and go to Florida, right? Um, we got to get better at that. Uh, establishment of the resp uh, emergency response teams and identify and training individuals who will form emergency response teams, including first responders, medical personnel, and volunteers to ensure a swift and organized response to the disaster. Who's going where and when? Our communications, uh, making sure that we are establishing and testing the communication systems. It includes the public alerts, two-way radios, and other communications. I can tell you we've had a few situations where the communications weren't up to par. Um, and I think if, if we had kind of tested our systems in advance, we wouldn't have had the issues that we had. Uh, public education campaigns. Again, preparing, this is, can cross over with Mitigation, these two are very similar in nature, um, but public education campaigns, I think of things such as National Night Out, okay, educating individuals, getting out there and talking about what we're doing. Development of evacuation plans, creating and practicing evacuation plans, and coordination with the stakeholders. Establishing partnerships and coordination mechanisms with local, regional, and national emergency uh, management agencies, non-governmental organizations, and community groups. Having these conversations, finding out what these folks can do to us is an important part of the preparedness. Um, technology integration, incorporating technologies such as emergency notification apps, GIS and mapping, and social media to enhance communications and coordination efforts, effort, efforts during our emergencies. And then crisis communication protocols, making sure that our policies and procedures are in place and that we are using them, they're accessible, and that they are being followed to prevent any type of panic and confusion. Um, this COOP, so the communication piece, again, mitigation will, you know, see the need for having it. Preparedness is making sure, um, establishing, testing those communication systems. But the COOP, uh, continuity of operations planning, developing plans to ensure the continuity of essential services and operations for businesses and government agencies after the disaster. I do recall seeing that on my exam. Review regular, um, regular review and update of plans. And I may have misspoke and I apologize. I had said preparedness is for when the event is happening. And that is not accurate. And I apologize for that. I will remove that from the video. Hopefully, I will remove that from the, re the video. It is the confusing piece for me where they kind of overlap. So preparedness is, um, a lot of it is when the event is imminent. But there are also pieces of preparedness that can be taking place prior to the event. Mitigation is seeing the needs for the things that are taking place 
and making changes as necessary before the incident. But if you can see, they they overlap in places. And that's why I don't love this piece. Um, okay, Lisa, thanks. Um, so, and I don't even know if I can see the hand raise. Interesting. Um, so yeah, I apologize if I had... If if it be, if I said anything confusing there, because in my mind I'm like I said that the preparedness was if the situation is imminent and that was not correct. I shouldn't I shouldn't have said that. So I apologize. Um, because if you look at some of these things, some of them are if the incident is impending right now, and then others is um, prepping, being prepared for when that incident takes place. So. Um, regular review of the and update of those plans. And, and some of this should be done too. So when you think about it, recovery and preparedness, they could also overlap too, because as we're restoring everything back, we are now preparing in advance if this should happen again. So they all kind of overlap and, and, but I know um, the practice exam questions that I have they should be pretty straightforward. So you'll see see what I mean. And then under the response, the response is the immediate and coordinated effort to deal with the effects of the disaster and protect lives and property. So that means activating emergency response plans and the teams that are responding, conducting search and rescue operations, providing emergency medical care and shelter, um, get the shelters open, coordinating with local, regional, and national agencies, communicating timely and accurate information to the public, restoring essential services and infrastructure. And again, the response piece of restoring essential services and infrastructure could be just a temporary fix. So that response um, emergency plans are activated to ensure a rapid and organized response to the disaster. It includes mobilizing response teams, implementing communication protocols, and coordinating the resources, setting up staging areas, where are we going to go, who's going to be on call, who's going to be responsible for what. As far as the search and rescue operations go, deploying trained search and rescue teams to locate and assist individuals trapped, injured, or in immediate danger. These operations aim to save lives and provide emergency medical care. Evacuation and sheltering, coordinating the evacuation of affected populations to safe locations and setting up emergency shelters for those that are displaced. And it includes providing essential services such as water, um, and medical care shelters. And I have the triage um, things up there. That's more for EMS, but I put that picture up there because the evacuation and sheltering, again, this, we're gonna, where are our priorities, right? Do we have a nursing home or a hospital facility that is in the path of destruction or part of this? And we have to act accordingly as par, far as what is immediate, what can be delayed, what is minor, and what is just not going to get a response, right? Medical care and triage. Um, never mind. My pictures are backwards. <laughs> That's why I'm like, why are they up there? But that make, but it it also makes sense there. Uh, medical care and triage, establishing emergency medical facilities, and providing immediate care to disaster survivors. Uh, the triage systems are often implemented to prioritize treatment based on the severity of injuries, but it also goes towards the evacuation. Makes sense. Um, I don't know why that one's duplicated there. Again, I try my best. Um, communication, it looks like it's duplicated. Communication and information sharing, establishing communication systems to disseminate accurate and timely information to the public, emergency responders, and other stakeholders. Um, this includes public public warning updates and uh, instructions. You know, getting with your powers that be, very important. 
logistics and resource management, managing and mobilizing resources, including personnel, equipment, and supplies to support response efforts. Log uh, logistics plays a crucial role in ensuring the efficient distribution of resources to the affected area. That's usually done by somebody that's in command. And while yes, this is part of preparedness as well, again, in the midst of it, there might need to be um, reactive decisions made because the places that we've trained or the places that we're supposed to be are now part of a damaged area. Uh, coordination with external agencies, collaborating with our local, regional, non-governmental agencies, et cetera. Firefighter, firefighting and hazard mitigation. This is the actual response to controlling any type of fire or hazards, material spills, or other environmental threats. Uh, resulting from the disaster. Firefighting efforts aim to prevent further damage and protect communities. And again, the emergency disaster planning through emergency management, these are not all just for man, um, natural disasters. They could be made, uh, they could also be intact for uh, man-made disasters as well. Public safety measures, implementing measures to ensure public safety, such as road closures, traffic management, and establishing safety zones or stay out of zones. This helps prevent additional injuries and facilitates emergency response operations. Security and law enforcement, uh, maintaining public order and security in the affected areas preventing looting and ensuring the safety of responders and survivors. Our state, I remember we had a massive blizzard one time and our state declared a state of emergency and they said no vehicles on the road. Absolutely none. Not one vehicle. The only people that could be on the road are public safety and me, those that work in a hospital. Critical people. That's it. That's all you could be on the road. Um, and I just thought that was interesting and it was cool because it was a really bad storm and they needed to maintain the roads and they needed to get infrastructure back up and running um under the response conducting rapid assessments of the extent of damage to infrastructure homes and critical facilities um, this information guides resource allocation and prioritizes response efforts and i'll use uh, columbia county as an example and maybe Jason's in the audience now. Um, last year, last August, I happened to be at their facility when a Category 4 hurricane came busting through and I got to spend some time in the dispatch center. One of the things that we learned very quickly in the response period is that they were field responders, the POPO. They just, they kept calling in kind of the same hazards that needed to be reported, which made sense. And then I had... I had Jason uh, pull in one of the police, you know, higher ups and say, hey, maybe they can tie something to it, like some crime scene tape. I know in our area, our folks uh, had a can of orange spray paint, which they would mark and say, hey, this has already been called in. We don't have to call it in again. Uh, so having a piece of uh, crime scene tape that could be tied to the tree or the the pole that's down, et cetera, meaning this has already been called in. We don't have to uh, do this again. So damage assessment is part of the response. And then recovery planning initiatives, initiating initial discuss discussions and planning for the transition from the response phase to the recovery phase and includes uh, consideration for long-term recovery efforts. The recovery piece is the last component of the uh, four phases. Uh, recovery involves restoring and re reconstructing the community and its infrastructure after a disaster. Returning the community to normal or an improved state is sometimes a long process, right? So some of the key activities that will break down, uh, assessing the extent of the damage and identifying the recovery needs, implementing long-term rebuilding plans, providing financial assistance and support to affected individuals and businesses, enhancing community resilience to uh, for future disasters, 
reviewing and updating policies and regulations based on lessons learned, and monitoring and evaluating the recovery process. So I hope going back, Columbia County in their you know debriefing and their their kind of recovery process that they take that piece of information. Thank you, Tanya. They take that information and go back and say, hey, you know, and, and again, it goes back to that mitigation phase is to say, look, we have hurricanes that go through here. Um, just know if you see this on it, it's been reported. You don't have to report it because I know that while we were in that 9-1 center, the phones were ringing off the hook and you know, there were so many things that were being reported multiple times. Wouldn't it be great to have that system in place? Know that we're going to do that going forward and um, and work towards that and educating the public too, right? If you see this on it, it's already been reported. Thank you very much. Keep driving. Don't call me. Uh, a part of recovery is infrastructure repair and re reconstruction initiating projects to repair or rebuild the damage infrastructure, including roads, bridges, utilities, and public buildings, aims to restore essential services and improve community resilience. The damage assessment, and while we did this kind of in the response phase, it's more uh, detailed in, de de in depth here, um, conducting a comprehensive assessment to determine the extent of the damage to homes and the environment. Um, and it's included in this recovery planning and resource allocation. Where are the priorities? Economic recovery, you know, supporting businesses affected by the disaster through financial assistance, low interest loans and grants, economic recovery efforts focus on reviving local economy, economies and employment opportunities. And then housing recovery, right? Um, implementing programs to address housing needs for individuals and families that have been displaced or left homeless by the disaster. Uh, this may include temporary shelter, shelters, rebuilding homes, or providing housing. Um, environmental restoration um, initiatives to restore and rehabilitate the national natural environment, such as reforestation, shoreline protection, and hazardous material, materials cleanup, right? Planting more trees, building seawalls, et cetera, as necessary. Healthcare restoration, reestablishing and enhancing healthcare services to meet the increased demand for medical care resulting from the disaster. This includes rebuilding damaged healthcare facilities and ensuring access to essential medical services. And it might mean bringing folks in and setting up a temporary pop-up um, type, um, you know, walk-in clinic that can help with the minor stuff. And then education system recovery, restoring and improving educational facilities and services disrupted by the disaster. It may involve rebuilding schools, providing educational resources, and supporting students and teachers. So that's that. And then as part of the recovery, long-term planning and policy revision, when we go back and go, hey, that worked great, or nope, that didn't work, we need to fix that. So reviewing and updating our policies, regulations, land use plans to incorporate lessons learned from this particular disaster. And long-term planning aims to reduce the vulnerability of future events. And then monitoring and evaluation, continuously monitoring and evaluating the recovery process to assess the effectiveness of the interventions that took place, identify the areas of improvement, and adjust strategies as needed. And again, this is in recovery, but it's also part of mitigation, right? It's very similar. So we said that, you need to know. Um, the ENP candidates should review the emergency management process as divine, defined by FEMA. And these are the two websites that are listed. You should be able to just click on those when you get your PDF. And I would peruse them because, like I said, some of these are a little bit confusing as to which category they would fall into. Um, but just know that several of them overlap. So best guess at that point. 
NIMS, the National Incident Management System, the specific ones that Nina thinks that our 911 folks should be familiar with is IS-100, Incident Command Systems, ICS, IS-200, ICS for Single Resource and Initial Action Incidents, and IS-700B, Introduction to the National Incident Management Systems, which I would think would be first, but that's what NIMS is, and that's what it stands for. So any questions on the emergency management stuff? If not, we are going to jump into the categories of service disruption. And again, I'm going to give you some Tracy-isms. Uh, not necessarily how to remember, but again, just kind of just breaking down um, words to say, oh, this is a loss. And this is what the loss means. And this is an isolation. And this is what this means. So there are categories of service disruption, which may have affected you and your agency. But if you look in the manual, at the beginning of this section, there's a list. And the list has all the things that you see there, except two of them, the first two. So in the list, it says full or partial loss of service to the PSAP. But further on in the description, it just says loss of service to the PSAP. They don't match. And I think that's important because if you're looking for a definition and it doesn't say what's listed in that um, in the list that's in the beginning, it might be a little confusing. So the first two there, uh, full or partial loss of service to the PSAP in the definition section is listed as loss of service to the PSAP. And then loss of PSAP facility uh, is just listed as loss of PSAP. But it should say PSAP facility. And I have made a note to send over to the manual folks when they update the manual to make some changes. So we're gonna break down each one of these. And then I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second. And I'm going to share something else. If it allows me to. Yeah. Uh, yep. Uh, one of the documents that I am going to also give you access to is this 25 page document right here that I have created with the assistance of the chat GBT um, software, which allows us to kind of break down what each, uh, each one of these is. There's some definitions in here. It just goes a little bit deeper than the manual goes in and a little bit deeper than what I'm going to go into with the materials that Nina gives us. So you will have access to this document as well. So like I said, it's like a 25 page document that I've been working on. So I say, use it to your advantage uh, because there are questions. I do know that there's questions on the exam under the loss of, um, or the categories of disruption. So I'm just trying to make it easier. All right. So in the beginning of this section, it wants you to kind of reiterate the definition of the end office the end office is a central office that connects the telephone customers to the 911 network, but does not directly connect to the PSAP. So when I asked ChatGBT, like, can you break that down in simple forms for me? Because number one, I want the visual. And number two, um, I just want you to break it down in, into something I can more easily understand and it will match the visual. And so that's what you have on the bottom of the screen. In this context, the end office connects two intermediate facilities or networks that then route the call to the PSAP. 
So the end office is not what is sending the call to the PSAP. There are other pieces in there that will do that. The end office is responsible for the initial handling and routing of the call within the telephone network, but relies on subsequent stages in the network to ultimately connect the call to the PSAP. This means the call passes through other network elements. So I want you to think of it this way. If you remember when we were talking about the end office, the end office is where there was a demarcation point between the network. This is generalized phone terminology. There's a demarcation point where the local phone service ends, terminates, end office terminates. And then if the call has to keep on going, then it may need to utilize a long distance carrier, a long distance network. So using that, remembering what we talked about then and understanding that the end office is not just for the transferring of the 911 call. There are other pieces that have to be in place. And that's where maybe another central office is going to come in, other network facilities, the tandem, the selective routers, et cetera. So just that definition is there if you should need to review that before understanding the different losses and isolations as we move forward in the next slides. So isolation versus loss. In my little diagrams, my little Tracy charts, we're gonna refer to isolation with a dot, 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 dot around it, meaning it's it's isolated, it's, it's encapsulated, right? So for the purposes of these disruptions and services, isolation refers to a scenario where the central office or the end office remains operational, but becomes disconnected from the broader network. This means the office cannot communicate with other offices or central networks, although its internal systems may still be functioning. Loss refers to a complete or partial failure of the central office or the end office. This failure renders the office non-functional, preventing it from performing its intended operations. So isolation means it's separated, but it can still function. Loss means poop, done. Poop. It cannot function the way that it was intended. While both loss and isolation of central office or end office result in service disruptions, loss pertains to a complete operational failure, whereas isolation refers to a disconnection from the network with potential internal functionality. There are key differences. Functionality versus connectivity. Isolation refers to a disconnection from a broader network while the office might still be functional. Loss refers to the complete shutdown of the office's operation, making it unable to perform any of its functions. The impact of scope. Isolation of the central office primarily impacts networks, network connectivity, but may allow for some local operations to continue. Loss of the central office affects a broader range of services and a larger geographic area. Remember, the end office is localized. Central offices are broader. Isolation of the end office disconnects local customers from external services, potentially allowing some local services to continue. Remember, local. If it's isolated, pieces of it may work. And then loss of an end office directly affects local customers, cutting off all of the services. Recovery strategies, isolation in involves reestablishing network connections through repairing physical lines, reconfiguring the network settings, and addressing network level issues. Loss requires restoring the operational capability of the office through repair or replacement of damaged components, power restoration, or rebuilding the infrastructure. So 
while you don't necessarily need to know all these, you're not going to get quizzed on these specifically. I've put these here to help you understand the difference between isolation and loss as how the questions may be asked. Service, facility, facility. Service is the service, the wires, the cables that move the information from one place to the other. And the facility is the actual building that houses whatever it is that we're talking about. So we'll first do the full or partial loss of service to the PSAP. This is an interruption or break in the communication links cause a loss of service to the PSAP. This can cause a full or partial loss of service to the PSAP due to a failure in the communications equipment or by cutting the telecommunications cable. Now, the document that I'm pairing with this is going to give you a bunch of examples in each one of these. It didn't make sense for me to sit here and read them all. It's something that you have to just kind of go over and process. Loss of the PSAP facility, okay? This results when the facility housing the PSAP is destroyed or so severely damaged from a natural or man-made disaster that the PSAP cannot safely continue operations. It can also result from a threat such as an action or an event that requires evacuation, okay? So loss of the PSAP facility doesn't necessarily mean that the facility itself is totally destroyed it just means that we have to evacuate and we can't we can't be in here okay isolation of the end office the end is that demarcation point the end is local it occurs when the end office that feeds the 911 system has its communications linked to the tandem switch or selective router broken in this case, calls from the area served by the end office will not reach the PSAP. There are times where telecommunicators could be put in the central, um, in the end office to uh, intercept those calls, but there has to be equipment in there. This, I don't know of this ever happening, but it's identified as something that could happen, okay? So telecommunicators must be relocated to the isolated end office to answer calls to 911, or they can be sent to a location served by that end office with a seven digit dialable phone number to which 911 calls are redirected. In other words, your alternate. That's what we see more. We don't see dispatchers going and answering the calls at the end office. We see it being manually switched to go to our alternate. And these calls, um, if this is the case, they are not going to get to the PSAP to be sent back to receive um, that Annie and Allie information. Isolation of the central office occurs when the links between the central office and the serving PSAP and the remainder of the communications network are interrupted. The word interrupted, it doesn't mean severed. It doesn't say broken, like non-functional. They're interrupted. In this case, only calls from within the central office area can be redirected to the seven digit number at the PSAP that operates from the isolated central office. The calls will not route through the 911 tandem switch or selective router and therefore will not have any and alley. If your 911 system contains more than one end office, 911 calls from outside the central office serving the PSAP will not be completed as ex expected. They will be rerouted according to your alternate plan. This is what that looks like. There's a severing here, okay? I mean, not a severing, an isolation here. There's an issue here. The local calls can be routed outside of the network. But what does that mean? No Annie and Allie. Loss of the central office occurs when the communication equipment located in the central office fails because of a malfunction, water damage, fire, or other causes within the central office. All telephone services, including 911 to the area serviced by the central office is lost. In this situation, 911 calls must be redirected to the alternate. This is what that looks like. So 911 call gets placed. It goes to the end office. The end office 
would normally send it to the central office, which would then send it to the PSAP. But unfortunately, if there is a loss of the central office, then that end office is going to have to send the call to the backup PSAP. The loss of tandem switch or selective router results in the loss of call routing. So your selective router routes and it is through that process where the ANI is captured. So it results in the loss of call routing and the ANI service. Equipment failure for some catastrophic incidents such as fire damage, uh, fire or damage to the host can cause the loss of a tandem switch or selective router. This is why some 911 systems have dual geogra geographically diverse selective router capabilities of carrying the full load. So if one of those selective routers is down, the system can still um, function properly. Loss of data management system. This isn't just the data management when it comes to necessarily Annie and Ally, but it could be in other data type systems. The loss of the database management system can result from failure of any of the computers serving the system or damage to the building housing the data management system. Additionally, interruption of data links between the data system and the alley nodes result in loss of data transfer, which means no up-to-date Annie and alley or alley information. You may get uh, previously stored data, but not updated data. And then an alley node is a network node that sits at the point of the 91 network where it receives, stores, and creates information. It transmits data to communicate with other nodes on the network. You can have a loss of the alley node. It can result, again, from any failure, losses of failure by damage to the system, the big X, damage. Um, Additionally, interruption of data links between the alley node and the PSAP result in a loss of alley capability in general. You are, you're not going to get back any alley information with the loss of the alley node. The end result may be the loss of alley being available to the PSAPs. This results, uh, this, this reason, this is the reason many PSAPs have two geographically diverse alley circuits and geographically diverse alley nodes having backup and redundancy. And then the last thing that we need to talk about in this section with emergency management and loss of services is our TERT response. Telecommunicator Emergency Response Task Force, TERT. Um, this is the website where you can find the basic setups for TERT and um, the criteria, planning, implementation, et cetera. But TERT is a group of trained telecommunicators, uh, operations, and support personnel that are able to respond to and work in another agency to receive, process, dispatch, and monitor calls for assistance. And it involves specialized teams of telecommunicators that are deployed and can assist in response and recovery for those major disasters or incidents that take place, like the loss of one of our folks, et cetera. And then here is the uh, APCO NINA standard for TERT. I recommend clicking on the link there when you get your PDF and just peruse through there. Like I said, if they put the link in the book, it means that they may take questions. I don't recall seeing any TERT questions uh, or maybe just a general definition of TERT on the exam, but just know that it's there. Know they want you to know about it. and. I think that's what I got for you. That's what I got for you. So with that, if you have any questions, you can scan the QR code there. That'll go right into my email. My email address is there. Go ahead and like and follow social media. Um, I would appreciate that. And if you are interested in joining the on-scene first safety net group down there in the lower corner on Facebook. That is a safe place uh, where we support each other and their men our mental health. Um, and it is a private Facebook group. So if you do request to join us, please make sure that you list the agency that you work for. 
So if there's no more questions, until next time, heroes, stay safe, stay strong, stay here. We need you.